it's my pleasure to, to welcome you as uh, as Andrew pointed out so I, I work for an organization called Tech Research Asia so I'm one of the partners there and I work um, a lot in the M&A and advisory world so think of us as a boutique kind of analyst and advisory house so we look at the marketplace in terms of what's happening for technology and changes and we, we still interpolate that and we write a lot of articles and research papers and, and generally have a good look at what's happening in the marketplace which at the moment I sort of describe as drinking from a fire hose um, it's one of those it's literally my full-time job to read as much stuff as is humanly possible uh, about everything that's happening in technology. That was almost feasible. Um, I think it was last feasible in about 2008. Uh, it's now no longer feasible, uh, the, just the sheer quantity. And I think that's one of the interesting areas uh, as we move forward with this, which is with customers and as we start talking to customers and partners, it's increasingly difficult uh, to get really good, concise data on what's happening in the marketplace. And so what I'm going to try and do is to curate some of that for you uh, and give you a bit of a perspective as to what we see happening uh, in the market. Um, so, SD-WAN market. So, I describe, I describe kind of SD-WAN, and, and this is uh, it's probably the most unkind photo of Mark Andreessen. So, if you <laughs> sort of done deliberately, we're not friends, it's fine. Um, but obviously, the co-founder of Netscape, uh, and, and also a, a particularly renowned venture capitalist. Uh, he penned a, a very famous memo in 2011 about why software is eating the world. And when you think about what's happened in virtualization, for those of you who go back far enough, we had virtualization back in, actually in the 70s, in, actually in the late 70s. We went through virtual memory, we went through virtual machines, we went through virtual storage, we went through, we went through virtual everything, and the network held out as long as is humanly possible, like the, life, the last person on the life raft, and refused to move. And yet that was despite everything that we're seeing happening. If you look at the current trends that are happening in, in the marketplace right now, so we go out and we do a lot of research with CIOs uh, in ANZ, so we just recently completed another survey, 250 CIOs in the ANZ region. These are currently the biggest priorities. Cloud migration, still, still continuing. There are still more workloads not in the cloud than there are in the cloud. Data center expansion and migration. The flip side of cloud migration, interestingly, that we're seeing right now is customers are actually going, we're, we're certainly seeing, and I'll be interested to talk to some of you later over a, a glass of wine. We're seeing customers go, okay, okay, this cloud first thing, not so much. And I literally know, I don't know a single customer that's still doing cloud first. I know one organization that's doing it that's a partner. Everyone else has gone, hang on, hang on, hang on right workload, right environment. And as a result, we're seeing a flip to, to more data center expansion, more data center consolidation, and customers realizing sometimes public cloud's not the right place. It's too expensive, you maybe can't control it, and the right place is a different environment. That's a continuing trade. Digital transformation customer experience, massive enabler, uh, massive driver, every customer's talking about that. We've done lots of surveys. The number is between 70 and 85% of customers currently going, that's on our to-do list. Um, at a strategic level, at a board level, not at a CIO level. Modern workplace, all of our staff suddenly don't want to work in the office anymore and half of them don't even wear socks. It's like, a, what the hell is going on? Um, so I'm, I still wear socks. It's like, with, shoes without socks is just really, sidebar, shoes without socks, really uncomfortable. How does that work? Um, I understand young people. Um, modern workplace, you've suddenly got your staff are in a different place. So you look at what's happening with that and you go, actually, all of our staff aren't in the branch anymore. We had this nice convenient environment. We had a Sydney office, we had a Melbourne office, we had a couple of satellite offices. Suddenly everyone's working from Starbucks and from WeWork and in different environments. It changes everything. And the final one, of course, is overlaying that with security. Security is everywhere, and I don't think it's necessarily one initiative, but it's pervasive through the application, through the WAN, through the network. And the last one, I talk about shadow IT. I'm on a personal mission to eradicate the term shadow IT. Those of you who don't know it, it's the concept that all IT purchasing doesn't belong to IT anymore. That hasn't been the case for a while. It's not the case now. Last survey we did, IT control less than 50% of the spend. So it's not in the shadows anymore. It's just how it is. So as a result of that, you've got very different dynamics happening in the customer. So take, a, take our slice of how we think of the, the pie. And we don't think about traditional networks, modernization, other areas. And, and I sympathize. This is almost a... a empathizing with those of you here running um, significant organizations and trying to get on top of everything you need to do from an IT perspective. You take all those high-level initiatives, draw that down to a series of individual things from agile. You need to do agile, DevOps, microservices, containerization, omnichannel, social, virtual reality is relevant. Have a look at that. Let's do some loyalty stuff. Automation's good. We need new user interfaces, fast innovation, startup thinking. Do all of that with, and the number in ANZ, by the way, is IT budgets went up 6.6%, current forecast, at a macro level. Do all that with 6.6% more money. It's a lot. The to-do list is tremendously long. So even if you took a few of these different items and said, agile, infrastructure and cloud, ubiquitous connectivity, mobile and flexible working and web scale and speed. Even if you just pick those ones, everything here is underpinned fundamentally by a digital transformation platform, which is the network. 
So and what I'm coming on to is what's driving all of this right now? And the simple truth is that many of the ways that we used to do things just don't work anymore uh, in a digital world. You think about what we used to do with networks, right? We'd put an office in, we'd put another office in, run an IP VPN over the top, and that was great. And then suddenly no one's working there anymore and the workloads aren't there. Nothing works anymore. Uh, and the network's almost been, I would describe the network seriously as the last bastion holdout in IT. It's been the piece that's refused to move. The technology's moved, the workloads move. We've done SaaS applications, we've done modern front-end workloads, we've done desktop devices, we've done VDI, we've done a whole bunch of really cool stuff at the front. We really haven't done a lot of the network. It's been the last holdout. And some of that, to be honest, and I'm guilty of this, if you look, up, if you look me up on LinkedIn, you'll see where I used to work. Some of the network vendors may or may not be guilty for this. Uh, and again, a lot of the driver of this is, a lot of network vendors wanted to make sure that they kept control of the software layer and didn't separate those two things, because it's commercially not the way that things work. The market eventually, back to Mark Andreessen's comment, software eventually will eat the world. Uh, and eventually that disruption's coming, and, and we, we see the time as being now. And, and the essence of this is really, it's the application that's driving this. The most prevalent work of now, file sharing and all the other things that used to be important that we used to do, they're still kind of there. But many of you probably use Enterprise Dropbox and a number of different systems. They're applications. It's the application that matters. And the only single purpose of the network in the modern age is to serve the needs of the application. And the simple truth is the way that we've been doing this up until now doesn't work. It doesn't work in a world of applications. So take back to, I, I go back to punch cards, which is kind of fun. Um, but you look at what used to happen with great monolithic applications, simple VT terminals, easy screen scrape, low traffic. You move to a client server world, we suddenly started messing around with SQL Server and Oracle and ERP systems and heavy client server traffic. Things got a little bit more interesting. And then we suddenly went web and cloud-based apps, enterprise mobility, application to application connectivity, and CMO is just going, just build me an app. I need apps. I don't really know what they do necessarily, but spend money building some apps. And the truth here was that we went from very nice, neat packaged applications to a huge volume of business-specific applications coming through. And we did some research on this, being a, a research house. And we said, so we went out and asked a whole bunch of CIOs, how many apps are you actually planning on building? Because we actually thought, this is kind of uh, outside of the package. How many are you actually just building uh, in your own right? And if you can hopefully understand the graph, um, the numbers here from the scale is less than 10 apps, 10 to 24 apps. And that one, the 16% there is more than 100 apps. And what we're seeing is the driver behind this. So that number in itself is quite scary. Uh, and I think if you look at any, any broad organization, and, and as I mentioned, we do a lot of research with ANZ customers, which we, which we think is really pertinent because it, it gives us a relevant context on the local market. The average number I've seen in enterprise customers, if you do a full audit of how many applications they've got, is between 1,300 and 2,000. That's typically where we found the range. Uh, from a numbers point of view. Some a little bit outside of that scale, some at the very high end are, are a little different, but generally speaking, that's the number. And what we found with a lot of customers is, they say, well look, if I move to the cloud, that's great. If I move my workloads to AWS, to Azure, to Google, to Alibaba, wherever you might put them, I'm actually leveling the playing field. So many of you here, I don't believe are competitors, but if your competitor suddenly, you could, have a, you could have a competitive advantage because the way you ran your IT was more efficient than the way you ran your IT. You move both of those workloads that you were previously doing as companies to AWS, the playing field just got leveled. And so many of the CIOs that we talked to are worried about the level playing field effect, which is actually, I need to do something now on top of this cloud platform. It's not about moving, it's about what I do when I'm there. It's about re-architecting, it's about new applications. It's about getting into this new modern world. It's not about just moving the workload. Because as, as we all know, public cloud isn't necessarily cheaper and in a lot of cases it's actually more expensive. It's about the agility, it's about what you do with it. And if you're gonna do that, you've just moved all your workloads out of your environment, the network just fundamentally changed. And the other consideration is, and this is a real screen grab, uh, the other application, the other, the other thing to think about is, your users are suddenly not your users anymore. The drive for a lot of organizations is actually you're building applications now that are gonna be used by your customers. So this is things at web scale and at web speed. If you're commercializing the data in your organization, which is a, a trend that we're seeing, then your customers don't work inside your building. Your employees will probably be nice to you. Well, actually, in most cases, potentially not, right? Nobody ever phoned the support line to let you know everything was still working properly. Um, it's just not the way the world works. However, the customers that don't even work for you have much less of a filter. And so suddenly, your user base just expanded horrendously. And so previously, applications that didn't work particularly well internally, maybe not great, but externally, it becomes brand impacting, and the CEO is suddenly aware of it. So we've moved into a completely different world. So, this is why SD-WAN came along. And again, just a little, hi just a little history lesson from, uh, from me back from the 80s. I used to do some very early work in the UK in the, in the late 80s, early 90s with Marks and Spencer. 
uh, in the days when every Marks and Spencer store was connected by X25. Uh, and so we used to, which for those of you who know networking, so it's a super old protocol, but anyway, it was horrible. And we figured out we had a 17 minute window. By the time we did everything that we needed to do overnight, but by the time the store was closed to get all the batch sales reported up, we had a 17 minute window. <laughs> we went, That's really tight. Um, and so you watch the evolution of virtualization. We started with virtual circuits on X25 and Frame Relay. We moved to virtual LANs, which I'm sure all of you have got in your network environments. We moved to virtual private networks when we started building branch environments. And it's really just the next logical extension. So literally, it's the logical extension of what we've done with networking, which is we're going to keep abstracting. We're going to keep layering smart software. It's going to allow us to do smarter things in a more flexible way. This is the crux of where it's come from. So it's really an evolution of where we've been. It's just the evolution has been a little slower in networking than in other areas. Otherwise, we'd have run this seminar probably five years ago. Um, so what are the modern one requirements? The six things that certainly that I think you need, rapid provisioning. You need to be able to spin up quickly. If you're starting suddenly buying up, we're seeing a lot more M&A activity, you need to suddenly spin up uh, new environments, new people working remotely. How do you secure people that are working in Starbucks environment? That's fundamentally an unsafe Wi-Fi. What does the profile for that look like? How do you do that automatically? How do you apply consistent security? If I'm using that application in a different way in a different environment, how do I make sure that actually that security profile is the same? A firewall, a single firewall access point for that is not necessarily the right way to look at it. Um, it needs to be resilient, it needs to be redundant. You need to be able to program the network in a smart way to say, if this isn't happening, then automatically reroute things. I don't really want to have to get involved in that. You know, we should be able to just program that, and then if something happens and the link goes down, just sort it out for me. Uh, and again, automation is one of those trends we're seeing a lot of, and that's something that we're seeing inside WAN. It needs to be application and user aware. You need to be able to program it to say, this application is more important than this one on Tuesdays, or on Thursdays, or at the weekend. You should be able to program that and let it set. It needs to be user aware. It needs to be context in terms of who that user is. It needs to be cloud ready. So that, uh, and again, people don't often think about the different dynamics between how you do SD-WAN connections and how you do WAN connections when majority of your traffic now, I would argue, is not going to your data centers and your premises anymore. It's going somewhere else. How do you do that? Especially if you're using multiple clouds. And we know the majority of customers now, and I'm interested to talk to some of you later, are doing hybrid IT and hybrid cloud. So you've maybe got some AWS, you've maybe got some workloads on Azure. You've maybe got some on-prem. Suddenly, you need to provide actually consistent application uh, a perspective and a user and security perspective across a very diverse environment. How do you do that? Uh, when previously with hard links, how do you do that? And you need real-time analytics. You really want to be able to see what's happening on your network at any one point in time, and then tell it to do really smart things based on what that traffic is telling you. So if you've got too much YouTube traffic, you should be able to turn that off. You should be able to reduce that and say, you can't do that right now. That's not important traffic for us. So SD-WAN, this is the token very complicated diagram. You can ignore most of that. Um, the guys will talk to you a little bit more about how it works. The, the principal piece and the only piece I really want to talk about is the concept here is whatever you've got at this layer, you have an orchestration layer over the top. So you've got a set of smart technology and software that sits on the top of this thing that lets you do with it whatever you want to do with it. So we separate the physical from the virtual. It allows you to program the network in a smart way. Uh, and the nice thing here is what we're really separating as well is whatever connections you've got. You know, and people often talk about SD-WAN being the excuse to turn over or the excuse to remove MPLS from the network. It's not necessarily the case. What it enables you to do is to think about the types of connections you need, the bandwidth that you need, separate from the conversation about how you manage the network. So they become isolated and separate conversations. You can have smart orchestration and then figure out what the right links are using real-time analytics. And that's really the trick with SD-WAN. So in terms of what's happening in the marketplace, if you think about the four trends that, that I like to think about, growth in global internet traffic between 2016, and we're on track for this, if not uh, above target. Yay. Yay us. Um, is a 3x increase in global internet traffic in the, the five years from 2016. That's on track. The scary thing is mobile internet traffic as a share of that is also jumping 10 points. So the traffic is tripling. And actually, the percentage of mobile traffic is increasing exponentially as well. And this will be no surprise, particularly anybody here that's got infrastructure in Sydney. So our organization, Tech Research Asia, we have no offices. We made a decision very early on, we're not going to do that. We'll work from anywhere. So wherever we happen to be, we'll work from. That's a mobile, so everything we do, if you're ever talking to me and you're emailing with me, I'm invariably not in an office, we don't have any. Um, that's a trend that we're going to see more of, we think, as you start seeing Stone and Chalk and WeWork and those kinds of flexi work environments uh, increasing. SD-WAN traffic, currently estimated to be 25% of all WAN traffic uh, within the next three years. Uh, I think that's probably conservative. 
my personal view as, a, as an analyst. Uh, an enterprise bar branch bandwidth, I think this is super conservative, doubling every three years. I see it at a greater rate than this uh, in terms of that branch bandwidth and, and what's happening in the marketplace. But all of this just says basically, you can never have too much bandwidth. You can use it more smartly. Uh, and, and part of the, the trick of SD-WAN is being able to figure out from the analytics when should you put more bandwidth in or when should you actually optimize your traffic more efficiently and not spend on bandwidth. So we went out and asked customers because we like to do that sort of thing and said, actually, software-defined networking SD-WAN, how relevant? And the, the interesting thing here is nobody thinks it's not relevant. Uh, and so I talk about, like I say, well, I'm sure everybody here has done some degree of virtualization in their environment. They've done other concepts, but yet many haven't stepped into SD-WAN yet. It's seemed too complicated. The market suddenly seems to be turning. Uh, and again, this research, and this research actually is from about nine months ago. Um, so, uh, and even then, people saying, no, it's, it's not that it's not relevant. I might not have got to it on my to-do list yet, because the CEO gave me everything from a digital readiness point of view. But you've got to think of it as the platform on which everything else builds. So benefits, again, we went back and said, what are the benefits? So we got real customers again and said, what do you see? And sort of ignore the eye charts, a little complicated. The ones that I want to bring out, flexible workload management, being able to put the workloads where you wanted them, faster services delivery, greater ability or greater agility, and lower costs. Came through as, as by far the biggest benefits that people saw from SD-WAN, so in terms of real data. Um, so that's, that's what we're seeing in the marketplace. And so. To sort of wrap that up, first off, reduce complexity, simplified management, and greater agility. Uh, increasingly, we're finding, you know, people expect, and I, and I always use the analogy here that people expect technology to spin up. It's like we can spin up a VM in, I don't know, 11 seconds, right? There's, there's some notional sense of time about spinning it up. It doesn't mean you can necessarily spin up the rest of the organization that quickly, uh, but the concept of being able to get the network to do that at the same time is now where the concept is. Because typically you'd spin an application up, but then to set the firewall rules, to set the net network application, quality of service rules, and everything else would actually take you two weeks. Um, we need to get those things back in sync, and that's partly what SD-WAN enables. Uh, lower costs, more efficient. So again, uh, we'll talk a little bit later, but being able to program in LTE links, 4G links. We're starting to see the beginnings of 5G, 4.5G spend using those types of technologies in a flexible way, public internet, MPLS, NBN when it comes, using the right link in the right environment at the right time to optimize the spend. Better application performance, better user experience. At the end of the day, the application is king. And, I th and my personal view will continue to be king for the foreseeable future. We live in a world now of applications. And the, and the challenge as the workforce demographic does change, and it changes from us, from you know, sort of the baby boomers are largely rotating out the Gen Xs are coming through. We're seeing a lot of millennials and Gen Ys. They, ex they have an expectation of consumer-like experience in a work environment. Uh, you will never shake that. You can't educate that to change. We just need to actually change to a consumer-type experience. It's just the world we live in. And the final one, ultimately, better resilience from being able to program smart links and greater interoperability in terms of being able to connect your branch offices, your on-premises environments, and your cloud, and connecting it in a way that makes sense. So what it enables? Cloud, cloud migration offers you to be able to connect to public clouds. The digital, you get an agile network that can support whatever you're deciding to deploy on top of it, as long as you program the rules. New security and privacy demands, uh, greater visibility of what the application is actually doing. And again, depending on how you poke in, I'll leave it to the guys to show you in the demo. It's not necessarily about the fact that it's application traffic. What application traffic is it? What's happening inside that? What's really happening with the traffic on your network? Getting some real insights to that is interesting, not just the network's really busy right now. Why? What's actually happening on my network? That's been traditionally quite hard to find in a way that's easily digestible and, able to, and that you can actually take action on. ABW initiatives, remote working, co-working spaces, you've got to be able to integrate these new environments super quickly, right? Everyone's bolting on, everyone's working remotely. And the final one, all the edge devices, and we didn't touch much on this, but all of the edge devices and IoT scenarios need new environments, so LTE environments, sensors, low speed. You've got all these kind of quite remote environments, especially in a country like Australia that's uniquely geographically challenged. So my three takeaways. Demand for bandwidth isn't going anywhere. <laughs> uh, there's only one way that we're going with bandwidth to control costs. You've got to be using software. Networks are more critical than ever. And the digital platform, and I, and I do mean this in all seriousness, the digital platform is everything now. 
Everything is digital. Everything is, it's a very overused term, digital transformation, but it is genuinely real. We talk about a lot of hype in the industry sometimes. The digital wave, I think, is serious and is, and is here to stay. Everyone's looking to embrace it. Every single CIO we talk to has a change agenda that involves transformation and digital. And you really need to have everything enabled from the network upwards to make that really happen properly. Uh, and the final one is, can't protect what you can't see. As we start to see more proliferation of our people working in strange places, new applications being built, we need much greater visibility and tools and control to figure out what's really happening. Many of you have seen, um, we do some consultancy work in GDPR uh, and some of the craziness around privacy. Uh, and just the sheer number of breaches in the first 21 days from when the new privacy legislation came in, 32 breaches, I think, were notified to the OICD. So that the rate at which breaches are happening is quite scary. We've got to get on top of that. And part of that is understanding what's happening on the traffic. So with that, I hope that was an interesting um, little scene set for you. Uh, so it's my pleasure to do that. Thank you for your time. I'll be around a little bit later uh, having a glass of wine and some cheese. Um, but with that, I'll pass over to James to talk to you about uh, what's happening with Knowledge Networks. James, over to you. Thank you.